three different rulings on the record today in your court? Three different rulings on the record in your court today? It's a record. What's that? Only, he's the only full one. My, my, my dad's been, my parents have been married for 24 years. Shall we have uh, Mr. Durst? All right, good morning, Mr. Durst. Mr. Durst is present. And uh, counsel, your appearance is for the record, please. Yes, Your Honor, Dick McGarren. People? Morning, Your Honor. John Lewin. Morning, Your Honor. Habib Bailey to the people. All right. We have, uh, I see now, uh, two issues, but <clears throat> the matter was ordered uh, today for a hearing on a motion for a special master. And the parties have briefed the issue. I have read and considered your moving papers. And uh, I would just like to focus us in this way that there's a, a single issue here today, I believe, which is the court's protection of Mr. Durst's privilege, attorney-client communications, as well as those of any third parties and attorney or work. So uh, with that, it's the people's motion. Your Honor, I think the first issue with respect to the special master motion is that the court needs to... Do you wish to uh, stand? Oh, certainly, Your Honor. Thank you. I think the... Uh, does the court need the microphone or am I good with... Uh, You're fine. The, uh, the first issue, and I think the most important issue with respect to this motion, uh, is going to be what does the court consider in deciding whether or not there has been a waiver of privilege with respect to Mr. Durst as it relates to the Susan Giordano boxes. And then we also have the two related issues, which are the New Orleans boxes and the Houston's. As the court's aware and as counsel is aware, from the start, the people have never asserted that there was any waiver of attorney-client privilege in the Houston and New Orleans materials. And in fact, we have been very diligent in making sure that those materials were separated. Um, as the court is aware and as counsel is aware, the special master needs to be appointed with respect to those materials to go through to make sure that there are not unprivileged documents which are a part of those uh, materials that would then be released. So again, uh, 
that motion was done with respect to those materials to preserve Mr. Durst's rights. Um, the Susan Giordano boxes are a completely different situation. Uh, the people originally, Your Honor, does the court want to be heard about issues of voluntariness or is the court all in a position to uh, short circuit this by giving the, making a finding that in fact uh, Mr. Durst has voluntarily uh, waived his attorney-client privilege. Well, I'll, I'll hear from the defense, but uh, I have a, a different idea about this, and uh, that is that here you've uh, not uh, said definitively that there are any such communications within these uh, so-called Susan Giordano materials. So uh, what the defense has asked me to do is to delay a ruling on privilege, and it seems I ought to. It, because uh, it, the point is not ripe if, if there are no such materials. Your Honor, there are absolutely, I think the, um, I just want to correct that point. Uh, there are absolutely materials within the Giordano boxes that would have originally been privileged. Uh, without question, there's correspondence that Mr. Durst has had with his lawyers, things that he has written them. And our position from the start has been that Mr. Durst waived that attorney-client privilege in a variety of ways. So the court is a Right. And sure. uh, no, I, I, I read the moving papers, and I understand that. And uh, I, I'm not sure that I ought to decide that based uh, upon attachments to motions. It seems like I ought to have a, a, a hearing. Now, you've, you've made a good showing. I, I understand your position, but I, I still think the defense is a heard on whether or not there is waiver as to those materials, and I think it's uh, appropriate, for example, if there is a testimony as to a, a limited nature of uh, permission, and, and that may or may not be so, but it seems I ought to hear from a witness. Right, and Your Honor, we obviously, uh, we have no issue whatsoever with the court conducting whatever hearing is necessary. The reason that that issue becomes important is, as the court is aware, in support of the motion that we filed. And the original motion that we filed was to have that special master appointed, and we were very clear indicating the difference between what we'd be requesting the special master to do with respect to each of the boxes. The Giordano materials were important because our position was that the special master was to go in there to do two things. Number one, to go in and to separate whether there was attorney-client materials not involving Mr. Durst. Number two was to look for work product, which arguably Mr. Durst can't waive. The difference being what Mr. Durst gives to his lawyers versus what his lawyers give to him. Uh, that, w that needed to be done. The third thing that needed to happen was were there materials that we did not look through, that we segregated out because they might have attorney client slash work product that we were not entitled to see that in actuality are writings from Mr. Durst that are unprivileged. That's why we wanted the special master. It's and and uh, the special master can identify these documents and uh, set them aside and, uh, and uh, identify them and seal them pending a hearing. Right, and, and so the court's aware we went several steps past what we needed to do as ethical lawyers in this situation. On our own, um, we had uh, a team of uh, individuals unassociated with the case originally go through, separate out the documents. And then when we were going through, we discovered, you know what, there are uh, attorney-client materials that do not belong to Mr. Durst. So therefore, we took the action uh, that we've taken. As a part of that, we put in our original moving papers uh, several different ways that Mr. Durst had waived attorney-client privilege. No, I, I appreciate those. I, I read that. It's, right. it's, it's a good argument, but I think it ought to be uh, decided at a, at a hearing devoted to that uh, if we indeed ascertain that there are such documents. You're telling me that there are, so it we'll, seems like we'll have such a hearing. There's no claim of privilege. I mean, I'm sorry, there, there, there is no no claim, claim of waiver as to the Houston boxes, the New no. Orleans boxes. So uh, the special master, uh, assuming I appoint one, would separate those uh, privileged documents. And they're already, just so the court's aware, they're already separated and sealed. So what the special master would do is they would review them 
and they would make sure that in fact there are not materials that are unprivileged that were um, inadvertently placed in those positions by prior law enforcement and the U.S. attorneys who were involved in the New Orleans uh, litigation who separated the materials out. So that's why we requested originally why we filed this motion. As the court's aware, uh, even though we had every legal right uh, to submit at the time the complete interview, the transcript, et cetera, because it went to the very issue of waiver that we discussed and that I'm bringing up now. In fact, uh, the clearest waiver, Mr. Durst, as the court's aware, um, not only did he waive attorney-client privilege, he literally came forward and said it was his intention deliberately to do so, and that that's why he had sent uh, Jarecki and Smerling, the movie producers, to go back and review these documents to copy them. When I interviewed him, he reiterated that, and I attached those few lines in our original motion. In response, what we received was a motion back that made the argument. Uh, it argued many things that are not a part of this motion. It basically attempted to litigate every part of this case from start to finish. Included in that were the allegations that uh, my original interview was improper and deceptive. Um, it was supported by a declaration from a local attorney who interviewed Mr. Durst after I did. It was not recorded. It was uh, in, in no way documented. And that attorney made allegations that Mr. Durst was frail and disoriented and in essence didn't know what was going on. As we reviewed the motion, uh, we got to the end and we're looking, well, okay, uh, certainly they've attached the actual interview that goes to the substance of what we're talking about, and it wasn't there. And obviously the court is in a position where you're being called upon, Your Honor, to in essence look at whether or not there was a waiver in that interview, whether or not Mr. Durst was frail, whether he was, t he was taken advantage of, whether in fact his rights were not waived. There was an allegation that there was a Miranda violation for instance, which there wasn't. So at that point in time, uh, it was interesting to note that uh, the first that uh, I heard about that motion, um, we received it and then the next morning, there in the LA Times on <coughs> page one is an article uh, discussing the improper conduct of my office. So at that point in time, Your Honor, we did what needed to be done in terms of giving this court the information that it needed to make a finding. So that's why we filed that motion. As we sit here today, um, it's my understanding that the defense and we've had some conversations, uh, I speak to Mr. Ray and to uh, Mr. Lewis, and my understanding is, is that they're, they're objecting to the entire process. Um, so as we sit right now, Your Honor, I cannot see uh, how there can be any legitimate argument as to why a special master should not proceed. Um, we are certainly willing, ready, and able to litigate the waiver in this case, which as we said in our moving papers, Your Honor, is about the most obvious and intentional waiver in the history of jurisprudence. You don't find individuals who come out and say, this is why I'm waiving my attorney-client privilege and this was my intent when I did it. So in any event, uh, that was the, the first issue. Uh, and as we sit, if the court is saying that uh, the court wants to have, uh, wants to litigate and defense wants to litigate that issue, uh, we're ready to go. I don't think it affects the special master uh, assignment by the court. So that would be uh, the first issue. Right. Okay. So as I understood it, the um, the uh, there was an objection. The premise of the objection was that the materials uh, shouldn't be in the, the people's hands at all. And, and that is a uh, based on a, a fourth and a fifth amendment claims to some extent. So. I'll hear you out uh, on, on that point. Uh, 
Mr. DeGaran. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, yeah, our, our position really is that they're getting the cart before the horse. We need, we're, I don't object, we don't object to the use of a special master if and when we get to the point that uh, the people have proved that they have a right to be in possession of the probably privileged material. In other words, as to the Houston and New Orleans search, let's separate that for a moment. We'd like to know and like to inquire through the court what uh, they've read of that. I hear that uh, the prosecutor says uh, that they have another team of prosecutors that are separated from the case that have looked at it, but I'd uh, also like to inquire through the court whether the prosecution team in this case has looked at the materials from Houston and uh, from Houston and New Orleans enough to know that they are privileged or that there is a um, colorable claim of privilege. That's question number one. But secondly, on the Giordano materials, it seems to me that the prosecution has just decided unilaterally that there was a waiver and that therefore uh, they get to look at it. Uh, and we haven't had a hearing on whether, and we do object, and we want to make sure that we use the earliest opportunity that we have to object to the searches that occurred in Houston, New Orleans, and in uh, upstate New York, um, and Ms. Giordano's uh, materials, which where Mr. Durst had stored his materials uh, with her. Uh, she's basically a bailey of, of the materials. Uh, he used uh, her as a storage point. So um, I don't know how that got us to um, Mr. Lewin's uh, defense of his release to the public of a three-hour interview we're under an obligation of confidentiality as to the discovery materials. And we readily accept that obligation of confidentiality. But to read, and not only to read, but to see video and audio of that interview spread uh, in the news, it seems to me, first, the court should know that when we learned that they planned to file this, uh, Mr. Ray asked them not to file it openly, but to file it under seal. We're concerned about the effect that this would have on a jury panel. We're concerned about putting uh, selective pieces of evidence out in the public because it very mal well may affect uh, selection of a jury panel. So I'm not sure why, how that was raised in, in, in this issue before the court. We, we noticed on whether the court's going to uh, appoint a special master, and I, uh, I think the court has put its finger right on the problem. It's getting the cart before the horse. We need to decide first, before we uh, appoint the special master, uh, whether the government, the, the prosecution, is in lawful possession of what they uh, seek to review. Yes, we agree with the court there ought to be a hearing. Uh, and, and yes, we agree with the court that the, the people, the representatives, the prosecution, shouldn't be allowed to just unilaterally decide when there's been a waiver. We, we need a hearing. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeGuerin. Uh, let me inquire, <coughs> Mr. Lewin, uh, I, you did file a, a transcript and audio and, and video with, with the court yes. in response to the uh, people's, uh, I'm sorry, the people filed this in response, you filed this in response to a, a claim of uh, improper um, 
uh, interrogation, uh, a Sixth Amendment claim, a Miranda claim, uh, and in response you uh, <coughs> filed those exhibits. Would those were provided to the court, were they provided to, to others as well? Your Honor, they were publicly filed documents. So if we the, uh, the, the transcript I understand, but also the video and audio? The audio and video were filed with the court as public documents. Those documents in our office's position on any publicly filed materials. This is a case, as many cases that our office handles, that has significant public interest. Our office and our role as prosecutors is to make sure that the criminal justice system is transparent, that the public is aware of how things are being prosecuted, and when information is public, what exactly is transpiring. I want to back up because it's very important here. Although we had every right to have filed the transcript and the motion and the audio and the video, which are crucial because in the end we recognize and we are relying upon in part the defendant's waiver of attorney-client privilege during that interview to support his waiver of the privilege, we could have put it our initial documents. We didn't. We deliberately simply put in the five or six lines that were pertinent. The defense responded with a motion that had unsupported allegations, baseless allegations, that related directly to that interview. Their motion was not filed under seal. By the way, I am unaware of any legal reason why either side would be able to file either of those motions under seal. And I would add that uh, Mr. DeGuerin has been out in public making uh, proclamations that the jury pool is being tainted, etc. This is a public proceeding, Your Honor. This is going to be a public pretrial. It's going to be a public preliminary hearing. It's going to be a public trial. The evidence that is going to be admitted in this case is going to be public. So the idea that somehow that the defense gets to file a motion for the court to consider an extremely important interview, they get to mischaracterize it, they get to, in essence, Your Honor, I'm not going to pull punches here. Their motion wasn't true. It wasn't accurate, and that wasn't an accident. And they file that with the court, and they don't give the court the transcript and the information the court needs to make a reasoned determination and we did what is our responsibility and we filed our response. There's nothing unethical or improper about that whatsoever. All very interesting. It's not really a material point, is it, about, a, about waiver, is it, whether there is a, a Miranda uh, admonition or, or not. Really, if so, so we're having an argument about your argument. So uh, let's uh, let's let's focus a little bit better. Uh, the, the question now, and I understand you re you responded to to uh, what was uh, perhaps uh, personal, but let's uh, let's uh, talk about these different groups of documents. First of all. I took this uh, description of a team of prosecutors to be a, an idea of what you might do as opposed to what you are doing. Is there a second group of prosecutors that went through this no, material? Let me, let me, no, I, 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 it's what I understood in the first yeah. place. You described an ethical wall, and that's one approach. Another approach would be to ask the court to appoint a special master. Now, as far as the documents that are not identified as potentially privileged, have you already gone through those materials? Yes, those documents you've already gone through them. So the the only issue now is those uh, is the documents that are that are separated. You are asking the special master, should I appoint one, to to ascertain that uh, these things you have set aside are indeed privileged well, I, I, in the Houston and New Orleans materials. I need to give the court a little more uh, background on that. Originally, the New Orleans arrest, those documents were separated out, they were, excuse me, they were taken by the U.S. Attorney in New Orleans. There was a meeting between the U.S. Attorney in New Orleans and the defense. Uh, I was not a part of that meeting. They went through all of the evidence. Uh, there was, during that meeting, 
there was no explanation by either side, uh, no acknowledgement by either side at the meeting that there were potentially privileged materials there. Um, in approximately late June, if I recall, I got a message from uh, Mr. Lewis saying, you know what, it turns out there are privileged documents in the New Orleans uh, case, and if you have looked at them, please don't, um, anything that's privileged. So um, we didn't. Uh, we had been sent a copy of some of the documents. Uh, they had been sent to the FBI, and we'd never picked them up. Um, that has, remains unopened today. Uh, eventually, what happened is, is that the U.S. Attorney uh, had a second team at their office go through and separate out anything that was potentially privileged from New Orleans. That was separately packaged, and when we received the evidence from the New Orleans case, once the disposition occurred, what the U.S. Attorney has separated has still never been gone through. Um, they've separated out the attorney-client stuff, so we've never gone through it. It does need to be given to a special master just in case there are things in there that it turns out are not privileged materials. So that is, uh, that describes New Orleans. Houston, when the detectives from Robbery Homicide Division served their warrant in Houston, they discovered uh, what appeared to be some attorney-client material at Mr. Durst's residence. The detectives separated those materials and they sealed them. Those materials have not been gone through. A special master needs to go through those materials to make sure they are in fact privileged. Um, the people's position, Your Honor, is we don't come in here and I'm not going to claim to you, I'm not going to argue, you know what, here's why those documents are not privileged. Mr. Durst did not waive any privilege in the Louisiana documents. He did not waive any privilege in the Houston documents. Now, obviously, not that it matters, but if, if there are similar documents, the same documents in an unprivileged location, then that is another issue that can come up. It's not really going to matter, but I merely say that for uh, clarity in my argument. So now we're down to the Giordano boxes. The Giordano boxes, once we carefully reviewed and went through the information that we had, which included the declaration, we, let me back this up. We became aware of the Giordano materials through uh, Andrew Jarecki and Mark Smerling. Clerk need a spelling, or does the clerk already have that? We have it. Thank um, you. They were directed during their original interviews, they had asked Mr. Durst to see materials. Mr. Durst had said, hey, I have all these boxes. They're being kept by Susan Giordano. Mr. Durst gave them her contact information. They contacted her. They went out there. She contacted Mr. Durst in front of them. He said, let them see whatever they want. They went through. They looked at the materials. They copied parts of the materials. We went back and we interviewed uh, Susan Giordano. When the defense filed their motion, it was interesting to note that they included one statement from Ms. Giordano from one interview and didn't include the other. You're getting uh, off track. Well, I, I'm letting the court know that if you just look at, so what we have in terms of waiver uh, of attorney client. I don't want to talk about waiver. All right. Okay. So I want to litigate waiver at a, at a hearing where the defense can be heard. Right now, I want you to describe the documents, the state of the documents, and what you're calling upon the special master to do. So what we're asking the special master, Your Honor, is to go through the boxes that we have. Those boxes we discovered when we started to go through them contained uh, correspondence between a lawyer who was not Mr. Durst's lawyer and an individual who was not Mr. Durst. Mr. Durst can't waive attorney-client privilege of somebody else. So what we did was we separated anything that we saw that had any uh, other lawyer's name direct to anybody else. It was separated out and it was immediately moved.
You know, uh, Mr. Bailing is, is, is correcting me on this point. And you know what, I think it'd be easier, Habib, if you sure. feel free. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Bailing address this point, Your Honor. As the court's aware, with uh, the complexity of this, some of us have better knowledge on some issues, and some of us have better knowledge in others. <clears throat> this one he knows better than I do. Usually it's one lawyer per side, but I'll make an exception for you, Mr. Oh, Bailing. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this hearing only. Okay. Uh, Mr. DeGarren inquired through the court uh, to us a certain question I'd like to answer if that's okay with the court. Of course, yes. Um, I myself and to the, my knowledge no member of this prosecution team has read any attorney-client privilege materials of Mr. Durst to answer your question. Um, with respect to the Susan Giordano materials, initially we had a team of DA investigators who are not at all associated with this particular prosecution. Um, review those materials, call out and separate <coughs> anything that had any potential uh, privilege or work product protection. Those were set aside and not reviewed by the attorneys on this particular case for a period of time. <coughs> at some point, when we went back and we were reanalyzing the issue of waiver, and I think that's why Mr. Lewin was going into the waiver argument with you, but I'll, I'll do it very briefly without going into the specifics of it. <clears throat> we realized, uh, in going back and re-listening to the interview conducted by Mr. Lewin, that Mr. Durst had in fact clearly, unambiguously <laughs> indicated to Mr. Lewin that he wanted Mr. Dreckley and Mr. Smirling to see everything, and that that in fact was a valid, unambiguous acknowledgement that he had waived his attorney-client privilege. At that point, the lawyers on this team began to re-review what had been separated by the DA investigators. <clears throat> In the very beginning, when we started to do that, we noticed, um, I don't remember exactly what it was at first, an envelope or something addressed from a third-party lawyer to a a third party that potentially was privileged. Not a privilege held by Mr. Durst, but a privilege held by some other third party. We stopped at that point. We realized this uh, issue is deeper than we originally thought. There potentially is privileged materials being held by other people not involved in this litigation. And we stopped our review of the cold, separated materials at that point. We have not gone through them. So those materials are separated, and yes. there remains a bo there is a box of materials that clearly, uh, at least in your view, has no attorney client privilege material or work product, and you've gone through that other box. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it's over 50 boxes. I don't know exactly. There's many boxes. Those 50 In total, boxes. there was 60-something boxes. All right. And how many boxes are there of uh, possibly privileged material? I believe it's two or three. Okay. I, please don't quote me on that. All right, but that's uh, – <coughs> all right. Um, does that answer the court's yes. question? <coughs> that, uh, that does answer my question. And uh, any further uh, re reply to the, uh, to the defense argument? No. Okay. I hesitate to go back and forth uh, <coughs> with uh, rebuttal and surrebuttal, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll allow you, Mr. Guerin, you seem intent on speaking. I'll hear you. We'll use our time for the next motion, Robert. We'd like to put it on the calendar. Okay, we got a bank. We got a motion bank. I've, I'm keeping track of your time right here. Very, very briefly, Your Honor, I'm, I'm still unclear, even with uh, Mr. Balian's uh, attempt to clarify it, what has been reviewed? Uh, it, did they did they decide based on the interview that perhaps is suppressible and perhaps was done improperly? And by the way, I have made it clear uh, to the prosecution since the day it happened that we considered it improper. Uh, it's not a new claim. Uh, did they take that whatever happened in that interview as a waiver and then read the materials. I'm unclear as to their answer on that. So we're looking for a, a clear answer. Um, there, what we did say, and I, 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 I <coughs> clearly
clearly hear the court that we need a hearing on waiver, and uh, but at the time, we believe Ms. Giordano was instructed and Mr. Jarecki was instructed that Jarecki was looking for a single thing, and that was a recording of a deposition of Douglas Durst, and they looked through all the materials to find that. But that's the kind of thing that will come out in the, in the hearing on whether there was a waiver or not. Uh, if the interview, and we say it is, we'd like a hearing on it, was improper because the prosecution knew that Mr. Durst was talking to his lawyers, has already contacted his lawyers, that is, was represented by lawyers, and yet he went and talked to Mr. Durst without contacting the lawyers. Uh, we want a hearing on that. And if that's where they say they, the waiver occurred, then uh, that will come out in the hearing on the waiver. So this re-review of the Giordano materials after they reviewed the three-hour interrogation of Mr. Durst uh, in the jail in New Orleans convinced them that there was a waiver. That's a unilateral decision of whether there's a waiver or not, and we believe it needs to be noticed and heard by the court. All right, thank you. And uh, this will be the last word. You have the burden of proof. Yeah. Uh, you're the moving party. Thank you, Your Honor. With respect to um, Mr. DeGuerin's uh, last claim, as prosecutors, we are in the position all the time as the first level of discovery. We make determinations as to what is discoverable, has been waived, what hasn't been waived, etc. The ethical duty, the ethical responsibility, that's what we do. When we discovered that we had the unambiguous waiver that we did in conjunction with the other evidence of waiver from Ms. Giordano, from Jarecki and Smerling, etc., uh, we took appropriate action. Going forward, and I think as the court has identified initially with this hearing, and as we did with our moving papers, which were very specific, at this point in time, what we're asking, what we're here today, is very simple. Uh, the court has said, we'll have a hearing on the waiver. We look forward to that. Um, the court has indicated that the court wants to decide this special master issue. So as we sit here right now, I'm not hearing any reason as to why the special master should not be appointed to do exactly the things that we have requested. In addition, we can set, and I was glad to hear from Mr. DeGarren, he wants that hearing on the waiver as soon as possible. Uh, so do we. Uh, but we're asking the court today to appoint that special master for the exact reasons that we have stated in our motion and today in court. Thank you. I'll take a brief recess. Five minutes.